Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Roswell Encina, the Chief Communications Officer for the Library, and welcome to the Library of Congress today. We are excited to host a wonderful conversation. His new book, Going to the Mountain, was just released yesterday, and we are honored to welcome the author, who is the grandson of global humanitarian and former president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, Mr. Ndeba Mandela. We are eager to hear his stories growing up with his extraordinary grandfather and the work he's doing to continue his legacy. First, I want to thank members of Congress and their staff, and of course, library staff who are here this afternoon. Also, thank you to our partners with the South Africa Embassy for helping spread the word of today's discussion. Also, I want to encourage you to visit the library's display in the foyer of the College Auditorium on your way out. Um, you saw it on your way in, and on display are amazing items from the library's Mandela collection, including some of his works, books, children's books, and a lot of other stuff. Also, today we're kicking off a lot of fun activities that will be happening here at the library this summer. Earlier this morning, we just did a media preview of our Baseball Americana. That exhibit opens this Friday. Also happening this um, summer, in a couple weeks, we'll be starting our summer film series, coincidentally, and not co coincidentally, that is, actually. We'll be screening film Field of Dreams outside. And a week after that, we'll be starting our summer concerts on the lawn. So as you can imagine, it's a very busy, busy summer here at the library, and we hope you will come back. Now to today's event. Following the conversation, there will be a book signing in the Whittle Pavilion next door, and books will be on sale for you to purchase. At this moment, we ask you to silence your cell phones or please turn them off. Our special guest is the author of Going to the Mountain, Life Lessons from My Grandfather, Nelson Mandela. The story of Nelson Mandela is also his story and he believes it could also be your story. He's continuing his grandfather's legacy as the founder and co-chairman of the Africa Rising Foundation, an organization dedicated to promoting a positive image of Africa around the globe and to increase its potential gro gr for growth in education, employment, and international alliances. Please welcome to the Library of Congress, Ndeba Mandela, along with the 14th Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. This is such a treat. And it's even more of a treat because your book just came out yesterday. That's right. And I got a chance to read it last night. <laughs> so we're going to do uh, and be able to talk about the book and some of the things in there. So we just thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Now, you've been to Washington, D.C. before? Yes, I have. I have a few times. I've attended the Black Caucus twice. Oh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, you could clap. <laughs> I heard a little clapping. So, um, well, in the book, let's just get right to it. Now, okay. having the, the last name Mandela and what that means to you, um, is there a lot of pressure or responsibility? Of you course, of course. Um, I think people have uh, a lot of expectations, uh, you know, being a Mandela. Um, of course, you know, they constantly want to put you in the footsteps of Nelson Mandela um, and want to know what are you doing for your community, you know. Um, luckily, I am doing something for my community through my foundation, Africa Rising. We're all about youth empowerment and education, technology, and celebrating African culture um, and developing entrepreneurs uh, in the villages, starting with our village in the Eastern Cape. Um, yeah. You mentioned technology. Now, how do you bring that in? Yes, so basically we are currently running a three-month computer coding program in Mtata. Uh, we, have, we are training 60 youth, uh, 40 are in high school, and the other 20 are unemployed youth. One of the biggest challenges that we face in South Africa is that we have 60 to 70 percent of our youth unemployed and up to more than 50% of them are unemployable. They don't have the skills to actually be employed. So we are trying to do that through teaching them how to do coding. And they write an exam with Oracle after three months. Um, obviously, they then qualify with a specific qualification, and uh, they, we then find them jobs. After three months? 
Yes. Wow. Very basic, but but, uh, but still, that's they, they, that's it quite is. something. They have a skill. They have a certificate that you know guarantees them that they have they have been proficient in that particular model, and they, it's an entry level. Now, speaking of jumping right into the book, as a young man, and I can see where technology's been a thread, you were very much into certain video games. <laughs> You may say which ones. Mobile ones. <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> Sports, music. Uh, and music. Yes. It was interesting to, to hear you describe uh, hip hop and all the things like that. You know, I was uh, very lucky. Uh, my older brother, he actually grew up in London. So when I met him when he was 17, he was playing Shabaranks. He was playing uh, Public Enemy, uh, the Fat Boys. The Fat Boys? Yes. Um, and uh, of course, Cool G Rap. And so, you know, because he was an older brother and I really looked up to him, um, I really followed him and, you know, the team he supported, Kaiser Chiefs, which is a local team, uh, in terms of um, the music he listened to. Um, the labels that he liked. Um, he was a really great influence for me at those uh, formative years, to be honest. Um, and of course, I identified with hip hop because we come from a history of fighting the powers that be, fighting against the system, fighting against apartheid. So when you're talking about being a rebel, it's something that's in my blood that comes from generations. Madiba himself is a rebel. And his father himself was a rebel. You know, um, basically my grandfather was born in a place called Mvezo, uh, which is a rural village. And then his father got into a dispute with one of the, his father was a chief, got into a dispute um, and basically punished the gentleman and took his cattle. And so he then went to the white magistrate to report this matter. And so they basically, denounced or removed the chieftaincy from our great-grandfather. And so he left and he moved to Kunu because he wouldn't give back the cattle, you know, because he said, you have nothing to do with this. You do not know how I rule my area. You have no right to come and tell me how I should govern my area, so please get away. You know, he told them to, to, to leave him alone, basically. And so they basically came with police, etc., etc., and they removed them forcefully. And so he settled in Kunu. Um, and my grandfather grew up, you know, seeing him. But another thing that he was, I guess, privy to was that we come from the royal kingdom of the Tembus, and we come from the fourth house. So we are a polygamous nation. So the first wife is the great house. The second wife is the right-hand house. The third wife is the left-hand house. And we come from the fourth house, which is the junior house. And every wife after that comes from a junior house. And in the fourth house seemed to be the house that mediated between the other houses. That is correct. So our job from the fourth house, too, is to be mediators amongst all the houses, especially amongst the two, first two houses because they're always fighting over the crown, and then to be a counselor to the king. So you see, Nelson Mandela did not fall from the heavens and become this great peacemaker. It is in his blood, uh. you understand? This is what he was essentially raised to do, to become. That's an interesting uh, idea of how your grandfather developed and what he brought with him. You mentioned, and the name of the, uh, the book refers to something. Yes. Going to the mountain. Go, going to the mountain refers to two things. Firstly, in our culture, we have a rite of passage uh, where you move from being a boy to being a man, and that is circumcision. We are circumcised between the ages of 18 and 21 because we don't believe you can be a man at the age when you're born. You know, usually here in the world, you get circumcised when you're born. Spoiler alert. You know, There's so, an entire chapter <laughs> on your experience. 
So for us, it's, uh, it's very important to understand, firstly, how to become a man. You have to earn the right to become a man. You don't just become turn 21 and now you're regarded as an adult. No, you have to earn this right, you understand? And that is, the first thing that happens is the chop. <laughs> Let's just say that was the, at night you're reading that and going, okay. <laughs> I couldn't stop reading. So that's the first. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it refers to, it's the circumcision process that we go through, which is really very rich because you get to understand who you are, your, your, your history, your, your heritage, um, your, your spiritual being in terms of how you relate to other tribes and other clans. Uh, and secondfold, it refers to the challenges, the journey that all young black people need to face in this world. People of minority we face some an enormous task. You have to go and apply to college. You have to make sure you get enough good grades to apply to college. And then when you, when you get into college, how are you gonna pay for those tuition fees? And when you finish college, how are you gonna pay back those tuition fees? And now you must begin your career. So these are all little mountains that we're facing as young people in the world because our job is much harder than the average white Westerner who has grown up in this privileged world, you see. So this is what going to the mountain means. And as Nelson Mandela said, after climbing a great hill and you reach the top of that hill, you realize there are so many more mountains to climb. And you, uh, to have the person that we all revere and we, know his public persona. When you were 11, you went to live with him. Yes. And what was, just tell us about that. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I, I, I was living in Soweto, which is a ghetto uh, in, in, in Johannesburg. Um, and so one day, this gentleman came, uh, my grandfather's driver, um, and he said, I've been sent by grandfather to come and fetch you. Come, let's go. And I mean, that was, I had only met my grandfather once before in 1990. This is three years later. Was he in prison then, right? Yeah, so we met him just before he became, came out of prison. And then, this is three years later, I never saw him, never heard from him. And then all of a sudden, there's a driver to come and fetch me who has been sent by him. And I'm at home alone because I'm at home at about 3 p.m. Parents only get home at about 6, 7 p.m. from work. So. I was not going to go with him, obviously, without the approval of my parents. There was no cell phones in those days. And so, you know, do you know who your grandfather is? Are you crazy? Do you want me to lose my job? Please, let's go. And I said, no, sir, I cannot. And eventually he gave up. My parents came home later that evening, and I told my father what had transpired. And um, he said, you know what? If that man comes again, you should go with him. Lo and behold, that man came back that very same week. And I went with him, and he took me to my grandfather's house, which was this big house and a mansion in the leafy white suburb, in, you know, northern suburbs of Johannesburg. And, um, you know, basically my grandfather told me that uh, he would be sending my parents to, to, to college. And while they're at college, they need to focus on school, and he's going to look after me during that time. And uh, my, my, I slept over that day. My father came uh, the next day, and he said, yeah, well, this is what my father has decided, your grandfather, and this is what's gonna happen. As a young person in any African family, you don't really have much choice, you know? You just have to do as you're told. And so that's, that's what happened. And now, from a ghetto, from sleeping, eating rice and tomato sauce, that was my staple diet, because we grew up in a poor home, to moving into this mansion where there's chefs, drivers, security, gardeners, da, 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 da. You mentioned that you felt like the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. I mean, it, it kind of like was that. Yeah. Kind of like was that, to be honest, you know? You just went, <laughs> and there you were. Yeah, yeah. And there he was, though, the private person that 
most of us could never imagine being with. What, what was that like? Uh, you know, he was, um, he was actually, the first couple of years, there wasn't much conversation happening. He was really just a disciplinarian, scolding me every time my room was in a mess. Um, and our conversation really revolved around school. What I needed for school, <clears throat> books, uniform, sports stuff. It was all about how's your report card looking. There was not much conversation outside of school stuff, basically. Um, and I remember once I lost my jersey, my school jersey, for the second time. And of course, I had to tell him because I needed a new one. And uh, I went and I told him, and I was, I was very nervous. And uh, he said, he was, you know, he changed his face all of a sudden. He said, OK, tonight you're going to sleep outside. <laughs> I was like, oh, OK. So off I went outside, you know, and I was playing soccer in the grass. And first hour was kind of OK, and then started getting cold. Started getting dark, and uh, then I saw Mama Oli, who was the little cook for us, bringing the blanket. And she came to get me the blanket. I said, "Oh my God, I'm really gonna sleep outside." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, maybe 20 minutes, you know, I was starting to make up my little bed, you know, on, on the grass. And uh, 20 minutes later, he came outside, and he called me. And he said, if you ever lose another jersey, you will definitely sleep outside. Now go inside, have your dinner, and go straight to bed. <laughs> and you know, it was kind of harsh, but it worked. I never lost another jersey. <laughs> <laughs> and you had that relationship where he you mentioned he was the disciplinarian. Yeah. In hindsight, do you think that you needed it? Of course, of course. I was a little knucklehead back then. <laughs> I just wanted to have fun and fun and more fun. <laughs> Whether it was, you know, placed, uh, it wasn't PlayStation back then, it was Sega, Sega, Sega Saturn, you know, or soccer, you know, that was, or watching a movie, you know, I'd go to him and uh, on a Friday, Saturday, hey granddad, can I please have 50 rand to go watch a movie with my friends, you know, and he'd always, always give me. There's not one time where he said no. So there was that softness under there. Yeah. Now, I, I wrote this one down because it, he said, to be the father of a nation is a great honor, but to be a father of a family is a greater joy. It was a joy I had far too little of. And with the years of imprisonment, he missed that. And so with you, he had an opportunity to do it. I it, guess so. I guess so. I mean, that, I mean, that must have formed his decision. Um, because, I mean, I also stayed with my grandmother for a little bit, Grandma Winnie. Um, he could have sent me to go stay with her, or my, my real grandmother from the first um, marriage, his first wife was still alive. My aunt was also still around, um, but he decided to, to take me in and you know, to stay with him. He had options, but he decided, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna discipline this young man. I'm going to show him the way of life, you know? So perhaps that was his way of uh, making some sort of, you know, compensation or retribution or, you know, with this, the father figure that he never had the opportunity to do that because he had to make an ultimate sacrifice, you know, unfortunately. Um, instead of taking his kid to go ride bikes, he had to go and organize the you know, peaceful protests and the marches and strategize on how they were gonna keep the ANC you know, alive while it was banned. You know, he had so many things to, to do that you know, focus on the country. So he had to make a, a very hard decision. You know? Sacrifice his family, four or five people, for the greater good of four or five million. And you mentioned that um, in private, he was uh, some of the things that we could see, humble and forgiving. Yes. Uh, and he had a sense of humor, though. Great sense of humor, actually. Um, he was actually a little, quite a little mischievous with his humor, to be honest with you. I remember one time uh, he, uh, 
I, I actually had asked a, a female friend to come over for lunch. <clears throat> and so he says, oh, nice to meet you. So did you propose to my grandson? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you can imagine the young lady was blushing from and ear to ear. she didn't know what. <laughs> she didn't know. Um, and he was always just trying to throw me, you know, like, hey, have you seen my grandson? And I'm like, yes, but I'm, I was always a bit too young because you used to have like the Miss South Africa would come over, Miss Universe would come over, Miss World would come over. Um, and I was just obviously in awe, but I was way too young. I mean, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't really hang. But he wouldn't care. He would just like, hey, did you see my grandson? <laughs> that was pretty nice. <laughs> That was pretty nice. So during this time, though, he became president of the nation. So were you aware of those? I mean, he was working with you and, and being part of your life, but he was helping to build the nation again. Yes. I mean, he was very busy. Uh, he traveled a lot. Of course, there were many weeks where, he, where I didn't see him, um, which were kind of fun because I could get away with murder. You know, I could play games until 2 in the morning and no one could really say anything. But when he's home, it's like, hey, the chief is home. You know, so you have to, you know, keep everything in line. Um, but the one thing that I realized about him is that, you know, that's a man with so much compassion for people, for, for ordinary people. You know, you can imagine Michael Jackson visited our home twice. You know, even former President Bush, Evander Holyfield, Mike Tyson, you name it. And all these people that, 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 that visited us, he treated them the same way as he treated Mama Oli who cooked for us, as Albert who cleaned the garden, as Bramaik who was the driver. You know, because I think the one thing that Nelson Mandela understood, you know, similar to Martin Luther King, was that you do not judge people by their skin color, by their age, by their race, by their sexuality, you understand that each person has the potential to achieve greatness, and we should allow that person to have the opportunity to achieve that greatness that they want to achieve for themselves. You mentioned that he treated everyone the same. I was really taken with uh, his phone call with Queen Elizabeth. But <laughs> <laughs> well, we think of her as I know, I know, because um, it's something that he was also being very mischievous with, with Grasso Michelle, you know. Um, I remember one afternoon, I'm not sure I should be telling the story, but it's, oh, dude. it's a bit late now, it's a bit late it's now. It's a little late. <laughs> Granddad, please forgive me for this one. <laughs> so, we are having lunch. It's me, my grandfather, and uh, Auntie Grasso. I call Auntie Grasso. And a phone call comes in, and Mama Oli comes. Uh, Tata, we used to call him Tata, which means father in Thosa. Tata, it's Queen Elizabeth on the line. Put her through, put her through. <laughs> <laughs> and then, obviously, the phone comes, he picks it up. Hello, Elizabeth, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> and um, they have a conversation, they talk, they talk, eventually, you know, <laughs> bye, bye, ciao. And Cross is like, oh my God, Matiba, how can you call the queen by her name? You have to say your majesty, Matiba. <laughs> and he turns to you and says, but why? She calls me Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. He says, uh, we always call each other by our first name. Do you forget that I'm a prince? You know, and he's like, you know, do you forget that I'm a prince, darling? Hmm? You've married a royalty here. Huh? <laughs> wow. <laughs> so you had the private side and you know about his legacy and that's why so many people are here and want to hear from you about how some of the lessons that you think can be applied today. There was a lot about reconciliation and being able to let go of, not, never to forget the hate, but to let things go, yeah. to reconcile. 
Yes, you know, I think you know, Nelson Mandela, obviously, he tried the peaceful way, right, of peaceful marching. But he says in an interview that all the peaceful marches and protests that they did, they were only met with violence and brutality and savage attacks from the government. And so they decided to now take up military action against the government. And so he became the first commander in chief of the military arm of the ANC. And he trained in Nigeria, I mean Algeria, for six months, and six months in Ethiopia with uh, Emperor Haile Selassie. And he came back and started obviously hitting back at the enemy. But they didn't obviously attack people, they attacked the infrastructure of the apartheid government. So they attacked the power lines, the power stations, they attacked the telephone infrastructure, basically. But of course, there were casualties, as is in any war. Um, and so obviously he was captured and he was sent to life in prison. And I think during that time in prison, he got to reflect a lot, obviously, and he got to see the independence that was happening across Africa, you know, from 1950 Ghana to 1980 in Zimbabwe, and most of these countries that were gaining their independence in Africa were going through civil war. And I think he really wanted to, to stop the cycle of violence that was really eating away at our country, at our society. Um, and so when he came out, you know, he decided to then obviously, you know, like forgive, you know, his, his captures, forgive those people that trespassed against him, you know. Um, and the one thing I have to ask myself is, first of all, that is one super unnatural thing to do <laughs> because if I was jailed for five years even, not alone 27 years, five years, I would come out with the vengeance and the anger of a, of a gorilla, right? And I'd want to blast all my enemies but he didn't, which is something very unnatural. Secondly, a lot of comrades, from Steve Biko to Solomon Matlango, who were caught by the apartheid government, were killed in incarceration. They didn't last long. So how come Nelson Mandela was not killed? Why was Nelson Mandela spared? And the only answer that I can come to is that God spared him that God was the one who was on the side and kept him alive for a specific purpose that he had to play after he came out of prison. And so he understood that they needed to kill this vicious cycle of violence that was taking our country. And him and Bishop Tutu then came up with the Truth and Reconciliation Talks that took place in the early 90s. And that was really to give the opportunity for the victims of apartheid, those who had lost loved ones, who had been tortured, who had been wrongfully uh, incarcerated for many years, to sit with their victims and to have some sort of restorative justice, you know, um, and for the perpetrators to be able to divulge every single bit of information in return for amnesty. Um, a lot of people feel that it wasn't really successful, but I think it really lay the, the foundations to try and get the ball rolling for a new dispensation, for a new country, you know, called the Rainbow Nation. That would be, and make people understood the value of peace and harmony over the continued violence that we had been experiencing for so many decades. Um, and I think it was just his way of trying to, to amend and to, and, to, and, to, and to eliminate his enemies, you know, because one of the things he said is that in order to defeat your enemy, you must work with your enemy because then he becomes your partner. And he had you learn Afrikaans. I did not learn Afrikaans, but I understand a little bit. I don't know if there's any Afrikaans-speaking people here. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, um, you know, I used to sometimes wake up in the morning and he would be in the lounge. He used to read all the newspapers back to back. 
he was actually very fluent in Afrikaans, reading and writing. You know, so much so that even in jail, the warden that was looking after the Madiba cell had to be changed every three months. Because what they found is that Nelson Mandela would be able to really connect with any human being, including the guard, right? <laughs> including the guard. So how he did it is that the guards would receive letters from their loved ones, but they were not as educated as Madiba was in their own language. So Madiba would translate the letters for the warden that was looking after him. And of course, now the man is very happy that he understands the letter, and now Madiba would convince him to, to smuggle in an extra few slices of bread, <laughs> an extra couple of oranges and fruits, and extra blankets, some extra jackets, you understand? And once the authorities found this out, obviously they were completely, completely, you know, angry. And so they changed the guard. And even when they changed the guard, the same thing happened again. <laughs> <laughs> so even in prison, there was no one guard that could look after Nelson Mandela without him ending up becoming a friend of Nelson Mandela. Hmm. That is the spirit and the power of Madiba because I believe he just had this gift from God that he could connect with his compassion to anybody. Whether that person spoke English or not, Madiba would be able to connect with you. Do you think he realized, he knew that he had this gift or that he had this responsibility? I think he, he knew that he had this responsibility. Um, I don't know about the gift, but I think he, he definitely knew that he had this responsibility. You know, and I can say that because he taught me, he told me, Daba, you're a Mandela, therefore people will look at you as a leader. And as a leader, you must get the best marks in class. And I was like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you know, I just wanted to be a normal kid and, and play and have fun and just do what normal kids. I don't have the pressure of having to study all day, every day so that I can have the best marks in class so I can be seen as a leader. You know, for me, I didn't really understand it at the time. You know, only much later did I come to, to grips with it. And so you've been able to, with your foundation, and to really yes. see how you yes. can keep it. Yes, No, I mean, obviously it inspired me uh, indirectly to start this foundation, but you know, one of the main reasons we started the foundation was I was very lucky to, to be able to travel, you know, with my grandfather and without him. And I remember my very first trip here in, uh, in, in, in America. We went to Disney World, of course. <laughs> I was 18 years old with my, with my younger and older brothers and cousins. And uh, we were trying to get onto a roller coaster. And eventually, you know, you get into the line, you get in front of the queue eventually. And the gentleman's like, hi, how are you? So where are you from? Oh, no, I'm from South Africa. And he says to me, so how big do the lions get? I looked at my cousin, I said, sorry, sir, I don't work at the zoo. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea how big lions get, you know? And uh, then we travel to London, and somebody says, hey, well, you know, oh, hi, how are you, South Africa? I heard it's dangerous there. I need security to come to South Africa. I said, sir, South Africa is quite safe. I mean, my grandfather's a president. I don't even have a security. I think you'll be just fine. I think you'll be just fine. And then we traveled to New York. And another question came, you know, in the same fashion. And then I realized that, no, man, there's something wrong here. People outside of our continent have a very skewed perception of what is happening on our continent. You know, and this is mainly perpetuated by mainstream media that Africa is a place of war, poverty, disease, and dictators. Now, we're not here to deny that these things exist. However, there's a lot more positive things that exist in Africa than what you see on your TV. And so we decided to start something. We didn't know what it was. We decided to start something. So when I got back home, me and my cousin called our colleagues, right? And we said, guys, there's something wrong with the image of Africa. We need to change it. And you know, what I realized that day is that I was not special because most of the people that I called to that meeting felt the very same way. So it is in the eyes and in the hearts of African youth in general. They feel the same way I do because they've seen it, they've experienced it. And so that day we decided to be a, 
a foundation, a non-profit organization that focuses on youth empowerment because we understand that the task at hand is not going to be achieved overnight. It's going to take two or three generations for us to be able to achieve the breaking down of the misconception in Africa so that they can see it as a place where they can go on holiday, they can see it as a place where they can do business. This is a place, when you look at the top 10 growing economies on the, on the world right now, seven of those are coming from the continent of Africa. Right? Many people don't know that. You want real growth and investment and return on your capital? Come to Africa. You want to have fun and experience the most tropical, amazing islands? Come to Africa. You want to have the freshest, cleanest garment draping down your body? Come to Africa. <laughs> huh? I mean, when you look at all the fashion houses, whether it be Louis Vuitton, whether it be Hugo Boss, whether it's high, low end, they are all taking inspiration from Africa. I'm not going to talk about the music and dancing because we're I was going to ask. <laughs> I was. <laughs> but so much and art. Yeah, yeah. So we basically focus on young people in high school level. We focus on education, entrepreneurship development, and. Um, and technology. So we are currently running a three-month uh, coding program for 40 kids in high school and 20 unemployed youth. Um, in South Africa, our, one of our challenges is that we have 60 to 70 percent of our youth who are unemployed. And over 50 percent of them are unemployable because they do not have skills what to about, actually get a job. What about the school systems? I know with the there were the divisions and things. So now, how are your education systems? Well, um, spotty? you know, it's the story of South Africa is that we have both the private and the public. The private schools in South Africa are some of the best in the world, have the best facilities in the world, and are really can compare to any in the world. But the public are not as good. We have a few good public schools. But majority of them are lacking in, very, in many ways, you know, whether it's the attitude of the teachers, you know, whether it's the facilities, but sheer down mismanagement of resources and lack of resources when it comes to the public sector. I mean, I know a school, which is not too far from our village, they are studying in a, you know, the shipment containers. That is a school. The shipment container, it's a whole school, you know, looking after about 200 children. And it's in raggedy, raggedy, terrible shape, to the point where I had a meeting recently before I came here with the teacher who told me that it has holes on the floor and there have been incidences where snakes creep up through. I mean, can you imagine a five-year-old, six-year-old? Mm -hmm. That is the most traumatic thing. That is the most traumatic thing. So how can you know, you, you, these kids are not looking forward to going to school. You know what I mean? They're not looking forward to going to school. Let alone the fact that they are poor, they can't even afford food. How can you learn on an empty stomach? So, the weird thing is that South Africa, our country in particular, has both, you know, aspects of a developing and a developed country. We have the best and the worst in our country. Literally the best and the worst. There are parts where you'll say, oh my God, I am back in the, in the Stone Ages. It looks like hell. And then there are parts where you'll say, oh my God, look at this, I must be in Monaco. You know, this is amazing. That, that is South Africa today. So it's a question of how do we close the gap? You know, that is our biggest challenge right now. This July, your grandfather would have turned 100 years old. And are there plans for a centennial? Because I really wanted, before we open it up for questions, I really wanted to yes, ask about there are some. there are some plans. Well, the Nelson Mandela Foundation, they're having the Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture, which has been given by Barack Obama, President Obama this year. Uh, that will be on the 17th of July. Unfortunately, we were having a gala dinner, uh, but it had to be postponed, so we have postponed it to the 1st of December, which is World AIDS Day. And of course, you know, uh, world, I mean, HIV AIDS is, is something that has played a significant role in my life. Um, I lost both my parents to HIV AIDS. 
and uh, since then I've become uh, one of the longest serving ambassadors of UNAIDS, uh, having traveled to you know, Brazil, Geneva, uh, Switzerland, talking about this epidemic. Uh, recently I was in uh, Russia uh, speaking at the East European AIDS Conference. Um, so yeah, I mean, we are by many you know, ways the average South African family. We've been affected by the very same thing that has affected all South Africans. So as much as we are Mandela's and you know, we have this great icon who's our patriarchy and who's our leader, we are very much no different from the rest of you sitting here today. Now your grandfather left that legacy as being felt globally. Do you, and I know you have carried on, and what are some of the life lessons you think that he taught you and that we can all look forward to? Well, the one lesson he taught me was, um, Daba, you must always be humble. Humility is very important, especially for a leader. You have to be, you have to be accessible, and you have to understand the people that you're serving, because as a leader, you are a servant. You are not there to boast, to show how much, what a great car you have, or how many A's you got. That is not a leader. A leader is not there to show I'm number one, you know, look at me. No, I'm there to make sure that the people that don't have a voice, who can't stand up for themselves, that is the people that I'm there to serve. So you have to understand who your constituency is. You need to have a constituency. Um, he said, you must be humble. And he said to me, Daba, you must never drive a Jaguar, because then people know how much money you have. <laughs> And then I thought to myself, but granted, you used to drive a Mercedes-Benz. <laughs> OK, OK. But you know, I'll take it on the chin. I'll take it on the chin. Uh, but of course, I think he was very serious at the same time. Um, you know, Discipline is very important. And he was one of the most disciplined person I've ever met. Um, you know, obviously, as he was getting older, he would, be, he would get sick from time to time. And the doctor would say, OK, you must eat more tomatoes. And you tell Mama Oli, Mama Oli, every morning I want you to slice up two tomatoes. And then, you know, a couple of months later, they would say, no, you must eat less tomatoes. And you tell Mama Oli, make sure that there are no more tomatoes. I want mo now I want apples. And he would do it religiously every day, you know. Um, just discipline, integrity, very important. If you tell your friend, hey, let's meet at the library at 2 o'clock, be there at 2 o'clock, you know. If you say, listen, I'm going to send you that email you know, later tonight, send that email later tonight. That's integrity on a very basic level, you know? Um, and it's very important. It goes a long way. Um, Madiba, what can I say about Madiba? Yeah, he taught me that love is stronger than hate because love comes much more natural to the human condition than hate. If a person can be taught to hate, they can be taught to love. And that is our theme for celebrating Nelson Mandela in the 100 years, is love and unity. Because through love and unity, there is nothing that we cannot achieve. <laughs> We know you got a chance to uh, make him proud, and I think he continues to be proud. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have time for a few questions, I understand. And there is a microphone, I hope. And here are some people, and if you'd like to, and of course the book is available on your way out. And there's a young man right here, right in front. Looks like he was about the age when you were trying to sneak out of the house. Should I introduce myself? Sure, introduce yourself. Oh, that's cool. My name is Joshua Burrell. I'm a rising sophomore um, at Morehouse College. I'm a cinema. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm a cinema, television, and emerging media studies major and a journalism minor. I'm from Columbia, Maryland, so um, I guess I'm commuting. Currently, I'm a junior fellow at the Library of Congress. I work in the Photos of Prince collection. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm an intern here, sorry. Okay. Um, my question for you is, you say that um, you see the best and the worst socioeconomically and on the educational level of uh, the public sphere in Africa. How could that translate to helping the black community in America? Well, you know, what that says is that, like I said now, through love and unity, you know, Madiba said, you can judge a society or there's no keener revelation to a society's soul than in the way they treat their children, right? So we have a responsibility to do as much as we can to make sure young people have mentorship, good mentors. They may not have the best schools, but we can each, one of us sitting in this room, mentor a young child for one hour or two hours a week. That will go a long way. If you can sit with him for one hour a week on a Saturday, right, and go through his homework and answer his questions about what he experienced during that week and what his challenges are, think about the impact that it will have if you do that for five years, right? We cannot continue. I mean, these days, the most influential people are no longer your lawyers or your policemen, right? The most influential people today are pop stars. Right? Your musicians, your actors, who are not necessarily cognizant of the effects they have on young kids' minds, right? Because they engage from time to time in negative behavior. And some of them will say, Well, I didn't want to be a mentor. I didn't choose to be a mentor. It doesn't matter whether you chose it or not. You are a person in an influential position, so acknowledge and embrace that position that you're in. Right? So if we can take time, to spend time with a young person and take some of the lessons of Nelson Mandela, don't you think this world will be a better place five to ten years from now? Thank you. Um, hello, I'm also an intern um, at the National Center for Higher Education. My name is Emily Mee. Um, I'm curious if the history that you have lived through and that your grandfather has lived through has offered you any perspective onto um, the way that our nation is headed and do you have any advice for folks who are concerned for the future of humanity based on um, some of the politics that we are living through right now and, and the direction that we're heading in as a nation? Yes, you know, when you talk about this immigration issue, which I see is very big right now, and it's very similar to our country. We went through a similar thing, but in our country, we, we actually had xenophobic attacks. Xenophobia is the fear of people from outside of your country, foreigners, fear of foreigners, pretty much. And it was so bad that our South Africans were physically attacking Ethiopians, Zimbabweans, Nigerians, etc., saying that they're stealing our jobs, they're messing up our economy, etc., etc., et which is a damn shame. It's a damn shame because these are the very same people that assisted you in liberating your country. These are the same people who built the fundamentals and the building blocks of American society, right? So how now do we turn our back now that we're experiencing prosperity and we're experiencing, you know, new opportunities and the technology boom and all these amazing new things, say, hey, you've built our country, now it's time for you to leave because we want to enjoy it by ourselves. You understand? I mean, we need to remind each other where we come from. How was this freedom won? How was this great country built? It was not built by Americans. It was built by people from around the world. So why are we chastising our brothers and sisters who helped us get here today? And, and also, I just want to say you should know that um, we are taping this because a lot of staff members from the library are here and are have to, they're going back to their posts. So when you see people, that's what's happening. Okay. <laughs> uh, Madiba, 
So Peter, yem yem, ngolom sila vela bam pencil. Titi ah zueliaji. Ah, clagas. Ah, that's how in Unu, where I come from, we greet uh, the royal blood. Ah, uh, Lomo, I don't have to introduce myself to you, uh, but for the benefit of the audience, I too, uh, my name is Yablela, and my surname is Mandela. I'm from the house of Mandela in Unu. I just wanted to affirm and confirm that indeed what you've written in your book is true. And I want to thank you, Mjomo, for the grand articulation of our culture and how we have explained to the world how the Tembu Kingdom is being configured, the configuration of the Tembu Kingdom. So therefore, I want to thank you, Mjomo, and say, as your younger brother, I've always looked up to you. Unfortunately, he didn't tell me that he's coming to America. I heard it from a journalist here. <laughs> And I said to myself, I'm going to surprise him. So as your younger brother, I'm inspired that by the work that you're doing in carrying it on with the legacy of our grandfather. And I'm learning to you, you therefore, you must not make a single mistake because I'm stepping at your foot, just like as you're stepping at my grandfather's foot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Family is everything. That's right. I wouldn't be here without it. Awesome. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, doing the book. My name is Masipula Sutole uh, Jr. Um, my question uh, relates to uh, Zimbabwe. And comparatively speaking, um, Nelson Mandela was one of the uh, 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 founding fathers, liberators, that was able to eventually help with the, the de democratization uh, uh, efforts. Um, as we are approaching elections in Zimbabwe, uh, July, they announced for July 30th to be doing elections. Um, my question is regarding the 25% of Zimbabweans who, who currently dwell in the diaspora and are being told you're going to be excluded from the elections unless you come back home to vote. Um, so my question is, is can you share some, uh, uh, some suggestions or some support um, and if you can also uh, touch on Pan-Africanism uh, on, on this one. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, you know, I can't really judge on that issue because it also depends on the resources of the country. You know, if the country is poor and they don't have resources to allow the citizens to vote by remote control, I mean, how can I judge, you know? Uh, we are lucky South Africa has those resources for people to vote at their embassies around the world. But, you know, just because South Africa can do it doesn't mean that every nation should do it or every nation can do it. You know, so it's very difficult for me to judge in that situation. Yes, obviously it's, un it's unfortunate. You know, you want as much uh, citizens to obviously be included in the voting, but uh, it's difficult. You know, it's very difficult. If they don't have the resources, to carry the embassies and get those votes back to their countries, you know, we can't judge them for that. We really can't. Um, so if the only way is to tell people to come home and vote, how can we, we can't judge them for that. You know, there's nothing we can do. But as far as Pan-Africanism is concerned, I believe the liberation of South Africa could not have been achieved without the support of our brothers and sisters across the continent, as you know. A lot of people helped us in Zimbabwe, in Botswana, in Swaziland, in Lesotho, all the way up to Nigeria, including Algeria as well, Ethiopia, you name it, Mali, etc. So for me, we need somehow, some way, through the independence journey, 
and in this post-colonial area, we lost that pan-Africanism that we once had. We lost that unity and solidarity that we once had. And it needs to be reignited. And I can see now, even in our continent, we are trading more with the West and the East than we are trading with each other, which has never happened before. We need to reignite that. Because if we do not unite and reignite that spirit of solidarity amongst Africans on the continent first and foremost, we shall never realize our role to independence. We shall never realize our dream to create a prosperous and independent continent of Africa. That is really the key to us achieving our goals and making sure that our dreams come to fruition. So in the spirit of Julius Nerere and Nkwame Nkurma, those men were true visionaries. And in the words of Nkwame Nkurma, he says, we as Africans do not look west, nor do we look east. We look forward. Eh? Thank you, brother. <laughs> I've been told that we have time for one more question. So we have a person here. Good afternoon. My name is Wayne Connor. I'm an employee here at the Library of Congress. I work in the Office of General Counsel. Um, my question is for, um, for someone who has obviously uh, been inspired by a great leader and who is currently a great advocate for many causes, um, how could, do you have any advice for young people like myself or others who might be in the room on how we can better um, you know, become a voice and become an influencer of change within our own communities? And, and, and what are some of the tools that we could seek out in order to be able to be better at that? Yeah. Um, you know, you have to choose a cause that you care about, that you're passionate about. It's like business, when you become an entrepreneur. You cannot be a successful entrepreneur if you're not passionate about that business. Because along the way, you will come across speed humps and hurdles, people that don't believe you, people that think you can't do it, right? So you need to have a cause that you're very passionate about. That will make sure you don't give up. Because people give up sometimes too quickly, you know, for various amounts of reasons. Now, you need to make sure that you surround yourself by people that care for you and believe in you. You need to have a mentor. Everybody needs a mentor. No matter how old you are, no matter how successful you are, everybody needs a mentor. And you need to then understand the people or the cause that you're championing, what their challenges are. You cannot champion a cause if you have not talked to the people that it affects the most. Otherwise, you are just shooting in the air. Right? You need to understand that constituency that you're serving um, and make sure you surround yourself with the right people. And often, that support starts at home. That support starts within your own immediate network. Now, if you can't get support from your family members and your friends and your own immediate network, then, my friend, I think you need to change your course. <laughs> because clearly, they don't believe you. And if they don't believe you, then I don't know where you're going to get your support. So first, the first thing is, do I really care about this thing that I'm trying to push? Am I in touch with the people that I'm trying to help, trying to give a voice, trying to get a law passed or an action you know, done or whatever the case may be? You, know, you need to be in touch with those people um, and have a mentor and, 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 and a support base, basically. And that is really the first steps of making sure that you are be able to, to serve uh, the objectives that you have set out for yourself. Don't do it because the girl that you like said you should do it. <laughs> or you do it because your parent forced you to do it. Do it because you yourself care and are passionate about that cause. We all thank you for sharing the life lessons that you learned from your grandfather thank and you. sharing them with all of us. And I am 
never uh, recommend books because of what I do. <laughs> but if you happen <laughs> to have a chance to read what you have learned and read this book, I think you would be in touch not only with your grandfather but with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. You're going to sign books. Yes, of course. All right. <laughs>